Good morning. We are about to start the session, so I ask everyone who is uh, still standing to take your seats and join us uh, uh, in the conversation about uh, CBAM, the EU's Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. So warm welcome to everyone in the audience and uh, thank you so much to uh, all the panelists that have joined us for the discussion today. Uh, unfortunately, we are uh, missing uh, the address uh, from the Ukrainian uh, economy minister. This is always, of course, a nightmare of uh, conference organizers that you receive some last-minute cancellations, but it happens, uh, and uh, we are still having uh, a very uh, uh, diverse representational voices on this panel to discuss a global response to the EU CBAM. My name is uh, Yulia Mihailak. I am a EU Policy Director for AITA, and I'm delighted to moderate uh, this discussion about a policy that uh, makes waves uh, 10 years before it's actually being implemented. Uh, it's uh, up to 2035 before the CBAM is uh, fully in force, uh, covering uh, now five sectors, uh, but um, most likely, as the Commission is saying, uh, in a couple of years, we'll see the extension of the EU CBAM to cover all sectors that are deemed to be at risk of carbon leakage, expected to generate 9 billion euros revenues by 2030, and uh, triggering varying reactions around the globe from countries, on the one hand, uh, threatening to challenge it at WTO, and on the opposite side, uh, committing to establish a domestic carbon trading. So the session will look at these reactions and uh, will uh, also examine the implications that the CBAM has on global trade. And without further delay, I would like to start uh, with uh, Rachel Armstrong, who is a director at the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero in the UK and uh, is involved in uh, works on a UK CBAM that has just recently been uh, uh, announced uh, uh, under public consultation in the UK. The consultation is still open, I understand, Rachel, uh, and you aim to have it in place on 1 January 2027. That's very ambitious to have this policy put in place designed and implemented within one and a half a year. So I just wanted to ask you why the UK decided to put its own CBAM in place and whether you're going to uh, make use of the EU's experience in designing that policy in the UK. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, so, uh, indeed, Rachel Armstrong. I'm the Director for Industrial Decarbonisation. Uh, and emissions trading in the United Kingdom, so I'm quite interested in carbon markets. Um, and I think if we, uh, if you think about where we are on the UK, see, um, um, there was actually a joint consultation between Treasury and the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero on a UK CBAM and product standards. Uh, and we got the government response out, so you could say that we got an announcement of uh, UK CBAM somewhere around Christmas. Um, and I think that is a hugely important step forwards. Um, and the reason for connecting those things, um, this is all about making sure that we count emissions properly and that we price carbon. Um, so we want to see carbon pricing because as long as greenhouse gases are free to emit, we will continue to emit them at scale. Right? So what you need to do is to make it hugely interesting to be innovating to produce low carbon solutions and to put a price on and get the most efficient way to get there using markets. Um, and that's why uh, we're actually introducing our own carbon border adjustment mechanism. So what is that for? You have to have a price on your emissions in order to stop just continuing to emit and to send that economic signal to invest. But you also cannot have carbon leakage. So what you have to have is an economically level playing field for fair competition. And that's what we're trying to achieve with the introduction of the UK CBAM, is that for our internal market, this is really important that you can't 
undercut domestic production by having highly carbon intensive manufacturing methods and then coming into the market at a lower price. I think that's also what the Europeans are trying to do. Right? So I think this is very much about how do you make it a level playing field at the point of you're inside the market, everybody has to play by the same rules. That is the intent, and that's why we're hugely excited about it. The connection for me to product standards is that, just like the CBAM, and I, I don't know if this is obvious to everybody, right? I think the, the CBAMs are going to have to evolve. So as we get better with monitoring, reporting, and verification, as we get better at understanding how emissions actually arise in different value chains, the way that we count has to improve, and therefore the way that we report has to improve. So I think this is commencing a journey. Um, we're now in second consultation period. So we've announced that we're doing UK CBAM. We're now doing the technical consultation. Input welcome, right? We really want to know where we might get it not quite right. I won't say where we might not get it perfect, because I don't think it's going to be perfect at the beginning. And we really want to be engaging in that dialogue about what are the unintended consequences of our best first steps, and how do we mitigate those if it is appropriate to do so. And that's also why we're going quite fast, um, but not quite as fast. So people might have expected us to harmonize it with the EU. We want to have a valuable chance of getting it right. Thank you so much, Rachel. You mentioned a few times a level playing field. And I would like to now turn to uh, Sarah Hay, who is a climate policy lead in North Hydro, the largest the European aluminum company. Whether you believe that the current design of the EU CBAM is actually guaranteeing this level playing field, what is your take on how the CBAM is uh, at the moment design, would it, will it provide it uh, for the EU producers of, uh, of uh, exported goods and receive them? Is it fair? Will it protect you against carbon leakage? Thank you, Julia. Um, yes, as, as you mentioned, Hydro, we're uh, Europe's biggest aluminium producer, also globally the largest integrated supply chain um, of aluminium outside. Uh, China, and we're really at the forefront of our industry in terms of producing low-carbon, recycled aluminium based on renewable uh, energy. Um, and it's really important that the design of CBAM works, that it does protect European industry from, from carbon leakage, because it's not just from, um, you know... Uh, from a strategic and competitiveness perspective, you know, making sure that you have the critical materials produced in, in Europe, but aluminium produced in Europe has much lower emissions, is much less emissions intensive than globally. Our uh, primary aluminium, for example, uh, produced uh, using renewable energy is a quarter of the emissions of the global average. Um, and so to, to get to your, to your question, Julia, so from our perspective, the, the current CBAM design does not work for European industry uh, in terms of protecting against carbon leakage. Um, and the reason, there are several reasons, and there are sort of two main ones I wanted to highlight today, is that there are some key circumvention um, risks and, and loopholes. So the, f the first one is that there are too few products in scope. So very few downstream products in the aluminium supply chain are within the scope of, of CBAM. So for example, wheels, uh, automotive parts, uh, which have high aluminium content, aren't included in, in CBAM. And so this really creates an incentive for um, these products to be produced and said move outside of Europe um, and instead import into Europe to European customers CBAM free, um, rather than facing the increased costs in Europe from the loss of, of free allocation. Um, and similarly, it's really important that materials that compete with those that are already within the CBAM scope are also included as to not distort competition. So from an aluminium perspective, that's copper and, and plastics, um, the, the most important for us. And then uh, the other sort of 
really large loophole that, that we see from an aluminium perspective is what we call the scrap loophole. So this actually provides incentives for high carbon aluminium to be imported into the EU CBAM free. So this is because industrial scrap, remelted industrial scrap based on the current CBAM design is treated as having zero emissions. Those emissions from the production is sort of forgotten in the, the CBAM design. So this is scrap that hasn't had a life cycle, hasn't been a product, and then now is being recycled to something new. This is a type of scrap that, say, you have a new aluminium sheet, and then you cut out profiles. This is what's left around the edge. It has exactly the same um, emissions content as those new profiles um, that have been created. Um, and so this means that there's no incentive for importers, so third countries, to decarbonize if they can just instead import lots of this remelted industrial scrap and base products on, on that and get around the, the CBAM cost. And this is really key for the aluminium industry because the amount of industrial scrap out there globally could meet all EU aluminium demand. So it could really undercut uh, European industry. So the design absolutely must be updated to recognize the, the emissions uh, in the scrap. So just to be sure that we all understand you well, if you are importing an aluminium raw material, there is a CBAM fee on the border. If you're importing a wheel made of that raw material as a final product, there is no border adjustment at the border. Is that correct? Correct. Thank you, Sarah. Um, while a response to EU CBAM can be to establish its CBAM, like in the UK, the response to the EU CBAM can also be to establish an ETS. And this is what I'd like to uh, talk to uh, about uh, with uh, Hussein Ayas, who is an expert on climate change in the um, Ministry of Environment, Urbanization and Climate Change in Turkey. Uh, Hussein, I would like to ask you to tell us a little bit more about the Turkish plan to put in place emissions trading system uh, and to uh, uh, tell us a bit more why actually CBAM has played such a big role in this decision, as we heard uh, numerous times from, uh, uh, from Turkey, that it was actually the decisive factor for Turkey to establish uh, ETS. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, we, uh, we have worked uh, to establish uh, ETS since uh, 2013 with PMR. Uh, PMR uh, was a uh, World Bank project, and with PMR we understood uh, the proper uh, carbon pricing mechanism is ETS for Turkey, and we have created uh, a MRV system. And now uh, we are uh, we are uh, working with PMI, uh, with uh, World Bank again, uh, uh, and uh, for uh, to establish uh, to, for implementation of uh, ETS uh, of Turkey. Uh, so, uh, if we say uh, that Turkey is uh, establish an ETS for only response to uh, CBAM, uh, it uh, won't be correct. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, targets about uh, our ETS uh, that we, uh, that we uh, want to establish. Uh, the important uh, target, our target uh, is uh, uh, net zero emissions at uh, 2000. Uh, 53 about our uh, ETS that we want to establish. So did CBAM play any role? Because what you said is uh, kind of uh, adding to what I've been reading uh, uh, before. I understand it was a factor that was relevant, but from what you said, but not the only one, right? Yes, uh, of course, uh, we will use uh, our ETS uh, especially our uh, carbon price uh, 
uh, for uh, take an attitude uh, to uh, front of CBAM. Uh, uh, but it, it is not only uh, reason of establish uh, ETS. Thank you. And given that uh, reduction in the CBAM obligations uh, will be provided uh, for those countries uh, that can provide that they have in place a carbon price system that is equivalent to the EU ETS. How uh, do you work on designing your ETS and its functionalities to ensure that its equivalence is in place and the Turkish ETS can be classified as equivalent to the EU carbon pricing? Uh, as you know, uh, we are a candidate country uh, for EU, uh, and CBAM uh, is reality uh, for countries that uh, make uh, export to uh, EU, uh, and uh, and we know uh, that, uh, as far as I know, the EU uh, ETS is oldest uh, ETS in the world. And uh, it uh, has uh, experienced, experienced uh, uh, a lot of tests, uh, and uh, now uh, it it uh, it is working uh, well functioning, well functioning. Uh, because of these reasons, uh, we want to uh, establish a, a ETS uh, which in compliance with uh, EU ETS. Uh, and uh, uh, for these reasons, uh, we are following all process and directives and legislation uh, in the ETS, uh, EU in the ETS, and uh, we, we want to uh, adapt this to our uh, ETS uh, that we want to establish, uh, of course, uh, without regarding our uh, special conditions. Thank you, Hussein. Um, now I will move to uh, Andrea Marco, uh, who is an executive director at the European Roundtable on Climate Change and Sustainable Transition in Brussels, and has uh, just earlier this week published a report uh, analyzing whether the EU CBAM fits for purpose um, when it comes to uh, export of uh, goods covered by CBAM outside of the EU. And while Sarah said that EU must be redesigned, I wonder whether you can uh, share with us your reflection, whether you agree with this statement. And if the CBAM has to be redesigned, do you think that the international re response to CBAM would also have to be redesigned? Will we then have a new goal that others will have to kind of adjust if we have new, new CBAM? Well, we we just put it in place, <clears throat> but uh, the CBAM is a, like the marginal line and that you will always find a way around it. Uh, it is, when we, when, when the EU put together the Fit for 55 and the CBAM, this was the, wall, the war to end all wars. But then the Americans came to the IRA, then the Europeans came to the net in Milana, and they, we keep going like this. So this is a continuous saga. This is not something that is going to end up here. There's going to have to be at the end some rationalization and, and, a, and, a, and a different type of solution. Now, in terms of the in terms of the CBAM, the report that we put um, together and released last Monday was very specific in response to the review under the ETS on carbon leakage for sectors on the CBAM export. And I did, I, this report was done together with Mike Melling, who's a professor at MIT, and Aaron Cosby is a very well-known economist. So I would say there was a relatively well done numbers, and the numbers surprised me. I mean, I did not quite expect this number. There are a lot of assumptions in, in the report. There are a lot of assumptions on the price of carbon in, in, in the uh, uh, benchmarks. There's a, a lot of assumptions, but 
the fact of the matter is, no matter what the assumptions are, no matter you tweak it, but the direction of, of travel is the same. And the direction of travel tells you that unless you address the issue of exports, unless you address by 2034, in two sectors that we looked in, in, in steel and, and, and fertilizer specific products, the European price is gonna be as 35 to 40% higher than the world price. And that makes it basically being shut out of, the, of export. It's no way that European products can compete if you are 35 to 40% priced above. So that cries for the fact that you do need to find a solution for this. So for us, we know about the other things that, that Sarah's mentioned, we're quite aware of it. We, we, we've written quite a few papers on this. But right now, this is a prime example of a very urgent thing. Why is it urgent? Why is it urgent? Is because in the next 10 years, five, seven to 10 years, a lot of the installations in Europe are not gonna be functional anymore as a result of the Fit for 55. You're gonna to have to be a, have a capital investment turnover, an enormous one. And the question, do you invest in Europe or not? And if you don't have exports, then your capital, your utilization factor goes somewhere under 80%, and that is make it economically non-viable. So th there is, is it's, there's an urgency to it. And the fact that we're having this, re this review at the end of this year under the uh, market function report, my question is going to be to the commission, and I don't think there's anybody from the commission here, but what are they gonna have to find in that report to justify issuing a proposal? Because the CBAM has only been functioning, like kind of functioning for the last year or so, so how much do you discover? On the other hand, can you wait until 2028 to make a determination? So this is the, the first answer, and it, it, and it is a serious thing. Again, 35 to 40% surprised me, I didn't expect this. In terms of the reaction of other countries, look, I, I have to, to, to say this because I think this is a disclosure. I do negotiate for G77 in the NFCC and I actually chair response measures. And as such, I see a lot of traffic that happens. And I, I don't think it's a great secret that South Africa, together with other LMDCs, are preparing WTO challenges to both EU and, and UK CBAM. They're, you know, they're in the various stages. We did see that uh, coming out not necessarily for South Africa, because South Africa was very active in the UN FCCC negotiation, but what if you, if I were a policymaker, which I'm not, my concern would be especially that Brazil is taking the lead on this, and, and Brazilians are very good at what they do. And they, you have to remember that Brazil has the G7, the G20 this year, South Africa has the G20 next year, and Brazil has the COP next year. So between these three, kind of putting this in squarely or unilateral measures squarely at the very high political level and insisting on a terms of reference as they say, we don't want somebody else to define the terms of reference of the discussion. I think this is again something that I'm not, I'm not seeing, I don't think that I'm disclosing a great secret to you, Rachel, or the other ones, but nevertheless, I think for the general public may not necessarily be aware of this. And this is as such, I think it's something that we will have to monitor very, uh, uh, very closely because for hydro and others, this is an important element. It is part of the Fit for 55. Is it part of the deal? And this is not in place. If it's challenged and it, it doesn't hold, let's argue that, then indeed you have a serious problem. How do you deal with it? Because you, do, you have to have a problem. You have to have a solution. You can't have free allocation anymore because there's just not enough of it to go around and you can't have this, so what is next? I think I can kind of answer your question, but not maybe totally. Uh, you did let me now answer your question. We have invited the European Commission, and unfortunately they were unable to join us. Um, and uh, uh, I would like now to actually turn to uh, uh, Anna uh, Gastmeier, uh, who is a climate change specialist at Valle, uh, the second biggest iron ore producer uh, in Brazil. You're supplying uh, steel makers uh, around the world. You're operating in Asia, in, in Europe, in Middle East. Um, and uh, I would like to ask you, Anna, uh, do you see, can you tell us a bit more how, how your company is uh, preparing for CBAM? 
Uh, and uh, uh, do you already uh, see um, any um, impact of CBAM while uh, uh, discussing your contracts, while agreeing uh, your supplies uh, to the EU? Yeah, thank you for the invitation to be here. It's really interesting to see different backgrounds in this table, so really nice hearing about it. But a bit of background background on myself, I'm responsible for climate resilience within Valley, so we touch on risks and opportunities, also the part of compliance markets. It's interesting that for Valley, the CBAM wasn't a big news. We see that coming because since the adoption of TCFD in 2017, we have been applying internal carbon pricing, so trying to reflect the policies and trends around the globe in the regions we operate in, the, in the regions we have interest in. Um, for CBAM specifically, when the regulation came, we the first thing that we did was an assessment of impact, and we have discovered um, that within the iron and steel sector, we were part of it. We are under the CBAM. So basically, uh, Ten percent of our imports come to the Europe. We produce iron ore fines, pellet feed, but also agglomerates. And for agglomerates, we started to started reporting the embedded emissions um, this year. So it has been really interesting, and we have been we have been having a transparent transparent approach on this because we really believe that regulated carbon markets, compliance markets are essential for the, trans the energy transition. So basically, when we see the opportunities that we can leverage on, the, on compliance markets, for example, uh, articulated regulation, also when we see the import, the, the investments that it could bring for energy transition, we are keen to see that happening. So Valley has a really collaborative approach on that, and we we are really um, direct and indirect af affected by CBAM. So basically, in a direct approach, when our agglomerates come to the European Union, we are required to report, and indirectly, uh, when our clients purchase. Uh, our agglomerates, they also need to report if they, their productions come to the Europe Union. So it has been really interesting and we have seen a lot of co collaboration around that because our clients is more interested in our productions and our emissions at, and also they are required to report to the European Union. So a lot of co collaboration happening we see also pass passive and active reporting, uh, which is natural, uh, as the CBAM has entered in force in not so long. And I think that that's the main that the main point that we are seeing. Like everyone is getting getting together um, to report and be transparent on, to the European Union. So you haven't had this. Uh moment of concern when actually while reading the regulation you realize that at the very beginning in the transitional period this is where we are right now that started october last year and runs until the end of next year it is possible to report for the first reports based on default values for industrial uh, production and uh, products and later on there is a gradual introduction of an obligation for uh, uh, cbam declarants to start uh, reporting based on actual emissions embedded in products. And we understand that for many uh, EU importers, it is a problem to uh, receive from their suppliers these values. They're already preparing for the third CBAM report uh, that will have to be submitted in July uh, and will have to include already a real values of embedded emissions. And uh, we understand that in many companies, procure procurement departments are being involved and there is a renegotiation of contracts because they need to have data which they don't have and not necessarily their suppliers are willing to provide. From what you said, Anna, I understand that for Vale, this is not the case, that you are providing this data already now, although it has not been really required for the first two CBAM reports. 
Is that correct? Yeah, it is because from Bali side, we are very used to, to account for our emissions. So basically we have the GG inventory since long time ago and we also have a carbon footprint approaches and we have been transparent with, with this information for a long time. So when CBAN entering force, of course we had a challenge to understand the methodology that EU adopts. It's different from, for example, the GG protocol or the ISO. But we were prepared and we are building the capabilities internally to do so. So basically when the requirement came to report emissions, we wanted to be uh, transparent for, since date one because the default values are interesting for the companies to use, but at the same time, it would not provide a fair, um, pers a f it, it, it would not mirror the reality from different countries. So we are seeing, for example, our production in Brazil has really interesting footprints in, and intensity and the embedded emissions that it's reduced from the developed, it's, it's, uh, it's less than, fr than from the default values. So when we share that with our clients, it's interesting for us. So that's the reason why we are taking a transparent approach on, on it and also sharing with the clients our perspective and strategies. Um, Valley has one of its main strategies to provide our own solutions to our clients here in the European Union or outside it. So we are trying to leverage our perspectives and leverage our strategy also uh, considering CBAM. And staying with the topic of default values, I will now turn to you, Rachel. Uh, as for the power import, there is no option to use actually embedded emissions. Well, there is an option, it's quite complex. You have to meet, I think, five or, or six conditions and that uh, uh, would allow power importer to uh, apply CBAM to embedded emissions uh, while default values are actually uh, those that uh, it is expected to be used by most power producers. Also those um, in the UK will have to report based on default values. Could you comment on how you view this solution in the UK? Yeah, so so it's, it's a really important issue for the UK. So, yeah, but I'm just gonna pause for a minute because I want to reflect on um, Andre's comments as well, um, because you're absolutely right. There is, uh, once you have CBAMs in place, you still have, what do you do about your export market? Um, that's also why we're, from a UK perspective, and I appreciate this is not a, a solution with great longevity, because anything that's under an emissions trading scheme is a, effectively a non-renewable asset, right? If we actually have a cap that's going to zero, you can't just magic up some extra carbon credits because there aren't any, right? We've decided there's a finite number. Um, and so what we're doing in the UK is we're very much looking at the CBAM as the extension of an economic system around how do you create the environment where it's economically rational to decarbonize and where you can find a way so that businesses can get commercial advantage from finding the cheaper solutions that enable the transition, right? And this is really, really hard, and it's really hard, right? But if we're having net zero, we are going to have to find different ways of doing the things that we're doing now. And it is something that ideally we would do on a completely collaborative basis. I think this is the conversation that plays out at COP. Right? So the conversation about just transition, who gets to do what, where, who's already had what. Um, and so it is about how do we build and demonstrate that you can have economic systems that work. So, uh, and I think that, that sometimes we do get into all of the tiny details, which do matter, but what we should be very careful about is not losing the intent, right? So this is how I'm making the bridge also to the bit about the EU CBAM, which frankly, um, is very, very challenging if you are a power producer in the United Kingdom. And the reason for that is that the interconnector should give us social value, right? It should give us uh, collectively a more efficient way to use power. And the way that it is structured at the moment is that um, because of the way that power is traded in the UK and it's not transparent, exactly which, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, right? But which molecules did you buy? 
we don't do it like that. Um, effectively, what could happen is you would end up with higher curtailed renewable power in the United Kingdom and Europe having more unabated gas combustion in your power system. So, and that's clearly not what we want, right? We collectively want to be decarbonizing the energy system so that we can do net zero. Um, and, and that's why we find it incredibly challenging because, um, because of the way that the calculations are not intrinsically linked, uh, you would effectively, from a UK perspective, largely be on default values for unabated gas combustion. We have happily backed out coal, right? So carbon pricing support and uh, an emissions trading scheme does make a difference. Um, but what you have, uh, then you have, but I've got a lot of renewable power, but now I'm having to pay a carbon price as if I were gas. So how does that work? And that's the fundamental challenge that we've got. So we would really, really welcome deep technical conversations about how do we check that the implementation actually aligns with the climate change objective, which has to also be decarbonisation of the energy system. Just one, one remark on that, and I think, Andrea, you also want to comment. I, I, I looked a bit on numbers, and it looks like that in the last 40 years, only in one year, last year, actually, the UK was the next net exporter of power due to issues yep. with French nuclear power stations. You are importing massively. Last year, um, the import of electricity was so high that it actually reduced domestic power generation by 11%. So how big is that, that problem, uh, kind of putting that in the context of these numbers that I've just read out? So I think, I think the challenge is, is that it damages investment cases in renewable power. It potentially damages uh, investment cases also in decarbonisation of uh, gas generated power. Because what you're talking about is the individual power companies being the ones that need to comply. So while on aggregate as a country level we're a net importer, the people who are actually dealing with the administrative question and what do they individually then have to pay, given that they are all already under the UK Emissions Trading Scheme, which has comparable ambition to the EU ETS, is where it gets really tricky. So you get into the details, and then for the individual companies looking at what should I do now, that's where we have the problem. Are you planning to cover power input under UK CIVAM? Uh, it's in the list of things we would consider. It is not immediately decided. Thank you, Rachel. Andrea, please comment, and then I'll get back to Hussain for another question. Yeah, look, we actually did some research a while ago asking UK companies what was the best before you started talking about CVM. And most of the answer was, why don't you just link the two ETSs and get it over with? And I think in the end, that, that was, this is AIDA, right? I mean, the, 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 the basic theme of AIDA is, why don't you just link the ETSs and get it over with? Actually, come back to the EU, that's even simpler. But uh, having, said, <laughs> having said that, having said that, uh, I, I do continue to think that I understand the direction of travel and, I think it was Mark Twain said, in the long term, we're all dead. So in the long term, it's okay. The question is what happens between now and them in this decade. In this decade. And, and, you know, I mean, I'm looking at my German friends and they're so happy that their, their, their emissions dropped. It's great. But I also look at the report that says it dropped because of dropping industrial activity and this is not what you want. Because, you know, at least where we come in ERCST, we want an industrial Europe, and we made no secret of that. It's important. And as such, in my view, it is a transition, it is to 2050, but it needs to be managed. And I think that allowing ourselves not to have a, a, a solution to exports urgently, it's just not a viable way forward. Because one thing I know from my days in AIDA, is that it's very difficult to sign a new member. It takes a long time, you gotta schmooze them, you gotta do this, that, and the other thing. But losing them, it's also very easy. All you get is an email. 
And if you, the same thing with an account. Once you lose the account and exports to get it back, it's not such a simple thing. So I would really argue that we need to think a little bit about the sequence and the timing and the fact that we don't want to end up in a situation where we don't have a solution for exports, not because on the export somebody wants to make more money, even though making money is the purpose of business, but because it makes simply the domestic production un, un, uneconomical, it just won't work. Mathematically, if you go under 80% in steel, it's simply not a viable thing. So again, we don't want to make this into a federal case because this is not the whole purpose of this discussion, but it's also a conversation, I think. So I think it's an important conversation. Comment? Well, you did say linking, right? So probably some people want to know. Um, so I think the, there's a couple of core points in here. Um, we do need to take the population with us. Right, so, so all of this also has to be things that take account of our businesses, take account of the affordability for the people in our country, right? Um, we are very, very strongly committed to carbon pricing. Uh, we've been doing it for about 20 years in different forms. Um, we think it's been hugely successful in the United Kingdom. Uh, and we are very open to linking with other markets because the economic case in terms of market efficiency is so clear, right? So we, we, it's not that we don't notice that. It is about how does this fit in systems. Um, we, you know, in the trade and cooperation agreement, we said we would continue to look at linking. We are happy to continue to look at linking because it has to be something that has economic rationality but that also makes sense for both counterparties. Um, so that's kind of where we are. I think there are also questions, as you just pointed out, it's very easy to lose a business customer and hard to acquire new ones. Um, there are also questions about um, how long would it take to renegotiate, um, which uh, I think the Swiss case took quite a lot longer than the difference between the implementation timelines of the CBAM. So uh, it would take a lot of willingness on both sides. I would like now to return to uh, Hussein um, with a question about the Turkish companies preparing for CBAM. We, we've heard from Anna uh, Vale uh, perspective on that, but while you are preparing emissions trading, you start with a pilot phase in 2025, it will still take a while before it is in place. Uh, while the reporting obligations are here and now, uh, and uh, there will be a start of a uh, CBAM uh, full phase uh, in 2026, gradually moving, well, it will take 10 years, though uh, Turkish companies are already having, uh, 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 are obliged uh, to uh, report to their um, partners in the EU about uh, uh, all data needed for, for reporting and later on they'll have to comply. Can you say a little bit on how they have viewed this measure, how they are preparing for this measure? Uh, uh, our, uh, our private uh, sector uh, don't, uh, don't take an attitude to CBAM, against CBAM. Uh, they uh, they accept this uh, reality and uh, they want to uh, learn and they want to adapt to CBAM uh, for their uh, benefits and profits and uh, we uh, under under the coordination of uh, Minister of uh, Industry uh, we 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 are preparing. Uh, uh, decarbonization roadmaps for uh, each uh, sectors uh, and uh, our uh, Minister of Commerce, uh, Commerce uh, uh, are preparing uh, guidelines for uh, how they uh, report their emissions under the CBAM. Uh, uh, preparation like that, uh, like these, uh, we and our uh, private sector uh, will be, in my opinion, uh, will be ready for CBAM uh, over time. 
Thank you, Hussein. Um, I will turn one more time to, to, to Sarah uh, with uh, uh, two questions. So one on, uh, on reporting. In the transitional period, there is no obligation for data to be verified by third party verifiers. It will change from 2026. But the Commission is obliged to come up with a report on uh, how this transitional period is delivering before the end of transitional period and has been already mentioned, possibly come up with a proposal to redesign, to, to change CBAM, to basically uh, revise the regulation. Do you think that uh, given that uh, uh, there is no verification and the data that uh, is being uh, provided in the transitional period can be viewed as misleading? There is a need to revise the CBAM regulation already earlier, not to wait uh, by the end of next year, um, but uh, act faster. And yes, <laughs> in short. So, yeah, this is something that we are really concerned about because the data that's going to inform the impact assessment uh, the European Commission is going to put together by the end of the transitional period is to which will look at whether CBAM is functioning uh, for European industry in terms of protecting car um, from carbon leakage. That will be based on this transitional period data. And because there's a lot of flexibility at the moment, uh, so far default values could be used. And sort of most importantly from our perspective that no third party verification is required of uh, the submissions data prior to 2026, the definitive period, there's a real risk of incomplete and uh, incorrect data being reported. So that means then that there's a risk of an inaccurate conclusion. You know, can you really trust the conclusions of that impact assessment? And another uh, relevant point, I think, which sort of Andre that touched on earlier is that it's very unclear for um, this particular impact assessment and also for future impact assessments, the uh, two yearly ones that are part of the CBAM uh, regulation, exactly how the success of the, implement, uh, the instrument is going to be measured, exactly what metrics will be looked at and what potential conclusions could lead to what step the steps. Um, there's a real lack of transparency uh, there. And from a European industry perspective, you need clear, transparent regulation in order to make the investment decisions that we need to make now, today, to decarbonize and, and make sure we meet net zero in, in 2050. Uh Thank you, Sarah. And one more question to Anna before I will open the floor for questions from the audience. So please prepare for that in a moment. Uh, Anna, do you think that uh, CBAM has a potential actually to affect global uh, trade flows uh, in the steel sector? Uh, you said that you are exporting 10% uh, of your uh, export volumes to Europe. Do you expect it to be, uh, this number to be affected in any way by CBAM? Yeah, first I wanted to, to ch touch on a point that Sarah um, bring. Basically, when we see the, the values that we are reporting for CBAM, of course, we don't know if they are totally correct because we don't have the verification. One thing that uh, we see the company is doing is using the, the values from its GAG, pro, uh, GAG inventory so they can like have the third party verification and then bring in the values for CBAM. But at the same time, we see the challenges from the re regulation. As operators outside the EU, we are seeing some challenges on, the, on how the EU considers, for example, um, power purchase agreements and how they consider the relationship between the electricity, produ electricity product producers and the operators from the from the thir third countries. So we also see that the regulation needs to be revised and we have been really vocal on, on telling the challenges that we are facing. We contributed in, in public consultancies um, and we are trying to expose the challenges that we have. 
Because at the same time that we understand that the methodology needs to be from the European Union, we also would really appreciate the bilateral discussions and how we also can understand the reality of, the, of different countries and regions and reflect that in the, in the CBAM, as the CBAM is an uh, international approach. Um, from your question about the trade, Yes, I see that it could it could have an impact because of all the companies are understand like we need to comply with the legislation and it's our responsibility to do so. But at the same time, we are trying to understand how things are going to move. So basically, from past years to now, we have seen steel making producers as well as miners um, having voluntary. Uh, reduction targets at the same time that we have our own strategies to decarbonize. So we, ha we are seeing, for example, steel makers in a coordinated approach um, having like the transition from blast furnaces to direct reduction. At the same time that we are trying to provide them iron ore solutions, for example, we have launched a new product to the market that's called the iron ore briquette. It's a low carbon solution for, um, for the pellet best furnace pallets, for example. But at the same time, when we see the articulated policies, right now this is not happening. We see every region of the world having its own policies and its own regulation regarding carbon, and it's disjoint, it's not articulated yet. It's natural because we are learning and also governments are learning how to respond to the CBAM and also, for example, the EU ETS considering now the maritime emissions. But I think, and I really see this approach happening, perhaps we are going to have a low carbon verticalization of the value chains because our, our Shipping emissions are being uh, are being under legislation. We are seeing the agglomerates from iron iron solutions being also under CBAM. The Brazilian market is also developing itself in a compliance way and also in a voluntary way. So we are we are seeing opportunities to ver verticalize the steel making value chain. Very, very quick. Uh, I think that this discussion is very interesting, but there's a lot of elements in the CBAM that are yet to be defined. I mean, what counts when you do the delta and what you pay for? We don't know that. We don't understand that. It, it, we have opinions about it, but it, it, it still needs. So this is not a minor thing. Why? Because also, to be quite blunt about it, if you expect India to have 100 euros a ton price of carbon is kind of hypothetical. I don't think it's going to happen very soon. So I think that you need to understand that. Second thing is we don't see right now another solution to dealing with this. So CBAM is it. It's an important part of, of going forward. But the fact of the matter is that what is very important is that we understand the urgency of addressing this issue. So the faster you get an answer to this question, the faster a more serious uh, review that is due at the end of this year rather than a little chapter in the carbon market report, which is, could, could be the answer to it, we hope that it's a very serious review that everybody understands that we, we, you need the process, you need data, you need to get stakeholders involved. So we just urge a very, very serious review at the end of the year. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. I just wanted to uh, further comment on um, what Anna was saying in terms of trade flows from an aluminium perspective. Um, if, so at the moment, direct emissions are just included for, for aluminium in CBAM, but the European Commission has uh, shown their intention to include indirect emissions as well for aluminium, also uh, for steel. Um, that's subject to a, another uh, impact assessment. And if that were the case, then there's a real incentive that resource shuffling will will happen. Um, and this also um, links back to what Rachel uh, was saying in terms of power prices in, in Europe. So if indirect emissions are included in CBAM for aluminium, and aluminium is a very electricity intensive um, metal, 
it means we're very exposed to to energy uh, prices. So when there was the the energy crisis uh, most recently, so since 2021, we've um, Europe has curtailed 50% of uh, uh, primary aluminium production, and that's largely down to energy prices. Um, so it means that in Europe, when we make aluminium based on 100% renewable energy, we still, in the power price, because of how the electricity uh, grid works in Europe, there's a CO2 cost in that power price, even if we're buying 100% renewable. And that's because the price is based on the marginal producer, which is typically a gas or, or coal uh, producer. Um, however, if you're um, in a third country, because this is just uh, unique, this pricing system to Europe, you don't pay that in your power price. So someone in a third country could make aluminium fully based on uh, renewables, not pay that CO2 cost in their power price at, at home, um, but then import the materials into Europe, not paying CBAM on the electricity at the same time that European producers are still facing that CO2 cost uh, in the power price. So there's this Im imbalance. And so this really exacerbates the incentive for renewables-based aluminium uh, from third countries to be sent to Europe and fossil fuel-based aluminium to be sent from third countries to other countries that don't have a, a CBAM or a, a carbon price. Just to complete this picture, there is also indirect cost compensation that uh, aluminium companies like North Hydro is receiving from numerous of EU countries. Um, Yes. Right? Yeah, that, that's correct. And the proposal has been from the European Commission that if the um, indirect emissions were included in CBAM, that in the same way the free allocation in the ETS is phased out, this indirect CO2 compensation, which partly compensates for the CO2 cost, would also be phased out. So we very much view that until we're closer to decarbonizing the electricity grid, so that CO2 cost is a much lower pass-through uh, factor in the... Uh, power price, the indirect CO2 cost compensation works much better as an instrument against carbon leakage. We have a, a time for uh, two, three questions from the audience. So uh, please raise your hands and introduce yourself while asking the question. I see one gentleman over there, Anders over here, and a lady in the middle in that row. Thank you. Yes, Victor from Climbees. We are a peer-to-peer -peer software solution for CBAM. And we are talking uh, a lot about the importance of managing CBAM, and I think Andre was absolutely right about that. But there's a big question which touched on here. How does the EU plan to verify emissions of worldwide factories? I mean, in what way? Will other ISO certifications be accepted on CBAM compliant as well? Or are we, this is a big challenge we see to really understand this. And we are working closely with this, but really understand how we are going to manage this. That's the first question. Whom do you address your question to? Well, <clears throat> maybe Rachel could answer that. So, ob obviously, I'm not doing the EU CBAM, right? They're not, <laughs> um, they're not knowledgeable. But, but it, is, it is also a fundamentally relevant question, right? So, because there is not, as far as we're aware, really high quality data for all of the assets around the world, right? Which is what you would de facto need over time. And then you would need to also go through all of the transportation methods and all of the other additive manufacturing processes. Um, it gets quite complicated. Um, so we're also looking at what is the best default methodology for proxies. And then I think the, uh, the approach is you um, you go for something that is reasonable, but is on the side of um, incentivizing people in that value chain to show that they're doing better. Um, and I do think this is one of the biggest structural challenges that is faced from a carbon markets perspective overall, right? So it is this transparency piece. Um, really great to hear your digital solutions provider looking at this because it is one we of are. those things that big data, uh, AI, and I would suggest supply chain orchestration companies 
might be able to help with? Yeah, we are working very closely with large European verifiers at the moment. Um, but it's still, the question is, is it, can we accept foreign verifying companies or is it only going to be European formats? That's not clear yet. Um, I would, and of and course, our, our methodology helps a lot with these verifiers. I would know. encourage you to continue that uh, topic uh, while having a coffee in a moment, as we still want to take two more questions, uh, if that's fine for everyone to respect the time. Thank you. Anders Noring from Veit. We are a carbon market analyst uh, company. I have a question for um, Hussein Ayas. Just if you could be, it was very interesting to hear about the Turkish plants, but could you add maybe a little bit more details on the timeline, which sectors that will be included? Uh, when does MRV obligation start? When will be the first uh, surrender of, of uh, permits? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, uh, we, we take in uh, companies uh, which come from two industry to RETS. Uh, electricity and uh, industry. Uh, our MRV are uh, following uh, 750 companies, uh, but we have a uh, threshold. Uh, we take uh, only companies that uh, emit emissions annually over the uh, 500,000 uh, tons uh, carbon dioxide equivalent, uh, how can I say, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, emissions, total emissions of uh, these 133 companies which uh, will be in the ETS, uh, their emissions, total emissions uh, is 90% uh, of uh, uh, total emissions of MRV and 52% uh, of uh, total emissions of uh, Turkey. Uh, maybe I can say uh, for your question uh, like that. Um, thank you. Uh, Katarina Grazeva, researcher from Central European University in Vienna. I have a question for Andre or anyone else who has something more to say. Uh, and I would like to ask about the EU CBAM revenue. And since it's supposed to create a new um, source of EU budget, I wonder whether it wouldn't be appropriate for a part of the revenue to be recycled or redistributed to countries that are uh, the most exposed and, uh, let's say, the most vulnerable uh, to, the, to the implications and uh, perhaps link it to the climate change mitigation policies. Thank you. Well, now I have godlike powers to direct CBAM money. Uh, look, when when the debate was on as to what was going to the design of the CBAM and what happened, uh, we, I mean, Aaron and, and myself and Michael, we're inclined that way, and and we thought that and our proposal was that it should be recycled at least partially to developing countries for a number of reasons. First of all, it's kind of a nice thing to do. But it also, remember, the CBAM, before before we got the CBAM, there was no CBAM. And the, 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 the argument was it will never fly from a WTO point of view. And then all of a sudden it flew because President van der Leyen said so. Now, the question is, does it really fly? And we'll never know that until it's challenged. It's, it's just one of those things. Now, if it's challenged and you do it for environmental purposes and you show that you do a lot more for environment, then the probability of this flying is better. And, and if you want to have a kind of hard answer why this would make sense from a practical point of view, it is because by giving some of the money back to the developing countries, I think you make the case that you're helping the environment. You, this is not a protectionist measure, this is an environmental measure, and as such, it will help the cause. But also, frankly, we are recycling money to European industries, to Innovation Fund, and many other, uh, many other methods. So I think that if we are taking money from developing countries, rather than having them pay to their own uh, government, 
then I think there is probably some justice or some fairness or some common sense in returning some, some of the money. Obviously, our proposal did not fly, but as, look, as this continues, the debate continues and will continue, because it, it, it has to continue. You have to think of one thing, if I can, Julia, for 15 seconds, is that right now the discussion in the EU is about agriculture and ETS. And yeah, you can say, well, you know, I mean, it's not there, it's not gonna happen next time. But it's, it is a discussion. And I'm not saying the decision has been made, but it's clearly a very strong train of thought saying that you should go into the, in an ETS type of system. Now, if you're doing away with free allocation for everything else, you're not gonna give free allocation to agriculture, you're gonna put a CBAM on agriculture. Now, imagine the international debate, not about aluminum, but imagine the Brazilians and the South Africans about CBAM on agricultural products. That is gonna make aluminum at the Tea Party. So I think the more we recycle this money, I think you make a better case that it's not a protectionist measure, this is a environmental delivery measure. Thank you so much, uh, uh, everyone who uh, contributed to this panel and to the audience. Uh, just to uh, say, uh, to close the panel, that on AITA website since this morning, you can find a report, kind of an overview, on international reaction to EU CBAM. We looked at 13 countries that react in a very uh, varying way uh, to that measure. So uh, uh, go to our website and uh, have a look if you'd like to uh, uh, continue uh, uh, exploring this subject. And please join me in uh, thanking the panelists for their contributions. Thank you.